Hello, and welcome to another episode of Two Average Joes. I'm Joseph St. John, and for those that of you who have been watching over the last several months, you're well aware that I have been involved in law enforcement for almost 30 years and got to be involved in a lot of things. So we're going to kind of start here with the arrest of John Norman Collins after a series of murders that he had. And my partner, as usual, as always, Mr. Robert Baker. And Robert, tell him a little bit about yourself. Robert Baker. I'm um, an, an attorney, practicing attorney. I've been an attorney in Michigan since 1997. Do a lot of criminal um, defense all the way up to the appeals. I got a couple of appeals at the appellate level and the Supreme Court level. I haven't made it to the United States Supreme Court yet, but I'm heading there. And um, we are here talking about John Norman Collins's arrest <clears throat> and his trial that occurred in ni- early 1970 and finalized in August of 1970. We appreciate all of y'all who have taken this long um, journey with us, yes. like Moses wandering through the desert. <laughs> we have, uh, for y'all Judeo-Christians, I'm sure Muhammad did something similar, but um, a lot of have- people are in the desert. A lot of people in the desert. We have gone. This is our 21st episode. And uh, we were talking a long business meeting, which we got digressed into comic books and other things. But <clears throat> we have tried to be thorough with this. And, and the end goal was, which we started was, is that um, Gary Earl Leiterman was convicted uh, in, in about 2005 or six of a murder that most likely he did not commit. And that's why the, 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 the long tortured uh, analysis of each one of these, because we believe that it's important that whenever we find some listeners uh, other than the, 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 the brave. Devoted. Uh, yeah, the, the, the devoted, devoted few across the 19 platforms that listen to us every time, which we greatly appreciate. We're trying to get some merch, something for you to be able to buy a hat, a mug, or something of, of ours. I, th- I, think, I think we're going to go and get one because we survived to average Joe. <laughs> that, that's what we need is a T-shirt, right? right. Hey, we survived six months of murder and mayhem with two average Joes. But, I think that's so, the least we could do. Right. So anyway, to dive in, so John Norman Collins is arrested, and the, the cops are – uh, botching uh, many different aspects of the arrest. Um, they had, they didn't, the, the task force, though it was set up at the time, had not really marshaled their forces or given people direction because you have people doing different things. You have some officers going out talking to witnesses and showing them pictures of John Norman Collins. Yes, yes. And, and let me stop you there, because as you get into this, I think that our listeners need to know this. And this is extremely serious. Mm-hmm. Even if you think John Norman Collins is guilty or anybody's guilty in any case, due process matters. It does really matter. Due process. matters. Yes. So go on, because I think that we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, because here's what happens when due process fails, innocent people end up in prison for their whole life, okay, or or parts of their life. So that's why we we beat the crap out of it. All right, and Joe and I, and Joe comes from it from the police standpoint. I come it from the criminal defense standpoint, and the, the process in Michigan. And I don't know when wasn't Miranda. It was Miranda in the fifties that it. No, Miranda's the the late sixties. Believe it or not. Okay. Yeah, so I want to go with the, the the late sixties. Yeah. So Miranda is important, and that's where the it, it made the police just get and tell you what your rights are, right? Right. The people, the failure I'm of guessing. Right. And uh, the police fought it really, really hard. And actually, um, most of the police now it, it's become such ingrained in our system that they have a, a little form that you sign. Yeah before you start spouting, right? And I, I, we cannot, as a defense attorney, I cannot get people to stop talking. because I they, think that, let me interrupt you. I think that's what police thought, that nobody would ever talk to us again. That's exactly what they thought, but it, it's actually the opposite. It gives them some kind of- I don't know. It's, we were incorrect. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, um, so Miranda comes along and you, you know, you're supposed to give them the rights and people just- Spout anyway. So John Herman Collins is arrested. The police are kind of around, going around trying to make their case after the arrest, unfortunately. Um, and 
They had uh, tipped John Norman Collins off to several things. So John Norman Collins, before he was arrested, was running around kind of cleaning up uh, the evidence. Uh, There was a bold box that disappeared from, if you remember, Karen Sue Bynum was believed Mm -hmm. murdered in the basement of um, John Norman Collins' uncle's house. A bold box disappears, and that bold box, according to one of uh, John Norman Collins' friends, John uh, Arnold Davis, John Norman Collins was seen taking that bowl box out or a bowl box out of his uh, residence, which was a, um, a flat or the rental place where he was living on Emmett Street. And it was full of a uh, purse of some female and some different females uh, items. So just to, to say that John Norman Collins is now arrested, that he is put in the Washtenaw County jail under supervision of our buddy, um, Sheriff Harvey. Yes. And uh, so they're gearing up. In Michigan, the way that the process of, of a case goes is that first there is a warrant issued based on a sworn statement or a uh, an officer will go in front of a magistrate and say there's probable cause to arrest this person for this crime. And that's what happened. And John Collins was arrested. <clears throat> there was also warrants for searches uh, done, I think, contemporaneously with his arrest. They go out, they don't find much, but they go through his car and they find many things, parts of uh, the dress from the woman from California. That's why we went through this tortured analysis of all these cases because they're all tied together. And um, as we've said, there's no definitive book on it. We may be writing one, I hope, eventually. But um, if not, we've got plenty of episodes. If you want we to. do have plenty of episodes for you to, to, to review. So once um, a person is arrested, they can bond out. He couldn't bond out. Evidently, the bond was too high. Interestingly, all of his friends start talking, all right? Arnold Davis does. They track down Mr. Manuel, Andrew Manuel, if you remember him from a California trip theft of the camper that went out to California. The one, woman was murdered. He actually rats out John Norman Collins for having the uh, poison oak. If you go back to that episode, Roxy Phillips, that's the one. And uh, they actually indict John Norman Collins, while he's sitting in jail out in California, they believe that that was a stronger case. California has death death uh, penalty. So they were trying to use leverage, trying to get John Norman Collins to hopefully fess up. Um, and if he did, he could avoid the death potential death penalty out in California. So got anything to add, Joe? I think um, I just double checked it here. I think the 66, 67 um is when miranda came in it's from a 66 case so i'm sure by 67 miranda was um being enforced Mm -hmm. and by the way for people that want to know about miranda actually he was murdered later and then when um they questioned the guy he took his miranda rights and they never convicted anybody yeah there you go there you go there's just a little bit of trivia there for you for miranda couldn't make it up yeah, you can't make this stuff up. You really can't. So um, John Norman Collins, while he was, okay, so Sheriff Harvey evidently had put him in the hole, okay? Yes. And I don't know where the hole is in Washtenaw County Jail or whether it's in the Sheriff's Department, but evidently it was a dark one-room cell with a hole on the ground for you to go use a bathroom, and that was kind of it. So Sheriff Harvey hears uh, John Norman Collins sobbing one night, or some of his deputies do, Evidently, John Norman Collins wanted to fess up. And uh, so they wake up Sheriff Harvey out of uh, sleep. Uh, he comes in. He says, well, he's got to have his attorneys at the time. His attorney at the time was a local guy, I think, that his mother had retained. And I, I don't think he was a criminal defense attorney. Maybe he was. Maybe he wasn't. We can fill that in, that blank in. But uh, the, the mother comes in and talks to John Norman Collins and evidently talks him out of fessing up. And uh so um, at the end, no confession from John Norman Collins at that point. Um, John Norman Collins had a series of attorneys. Uh, that guy was eventually fired. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they appointed uh, Richard Ryan. I believe his name is Richard Ryan. Uh, 
a local council who was uh, a partner in one of the bigger, more prestigious law firms in Ann Arbor at the time. And uh, yeah. let me stop he, you there, because I, sure. I think that one thing that we can say is that his mom was super involved. I think that with his mom, I, if I was going to be able to really emphasize something, I, I would say she is super involved. Now, it's weird because in a couple of things that we've read, they make it sound like him and his mom don't get along. But I see none of that. Mm -hmm. None of that. I see zero of that. I actually see them caring very much. Yeah. So, you know, he's in the hole and the mom gets the attorney and then they change that up. And I, I think he goes through a process of a few attorneys. Yeah, that was what the Richard Ryan, when our Ryan, I know is his last name. And <clears throat> he actually um, had talked John Norman Collins into doing a polygraph test. Okay. So they set it up in the judge's chambers, evidently, mm -hmm. to, um, to, for John Norman Collins to take the polygraph test. And the polygraph test, and I don't know what kind of, what the defense attorney was doing, but he left the door open. So some detectives heard the beginning <laughs> preamble of everything. Then they eventually closed the door. But uh, one, the polygraph was done in the judge's chambers is a little iffy Two, the door being open. And they heard it's kind of some substantial parts. I'm, this is out of uh, Earl James's catching serial killers somewhere around page 90, if you're interested in looking it up, but um so the, the polygraph never happens, all right? Or, uh, and as Joe can tell you, the polygraph, at least in, in the times of us, right. is used more for a confession uh, purposes right. because they'll lie about whether the, uh, the uh, taker will, will pass or not. And the, the anything said before or after is admissible as to admissions. So I do not recommend my clients do it. And, and, and nowadays, prosecutors will continue to prosecute anyway. So there is no benefit. But back in that time, They were taking it serious back in the day. They, it was science, man. It was science back then. and That's and, what you uh, want to call it. Right. <clears throat> but so it never happened. And uh, the, the polygraph never occurred. Supposedly, uh, Mr. Ryan, he got fired for by the mother or by John Collins after doing the polygraph test. Um, and they bring in the big guns after that. They do bring in the big guns. But, but before, so what John Norman Collins, mother were, lived in Centerline, Michigan, and she worked as a waitress in Detroit. Okay. And, and one of the people who um, frequented that was the, the head, head cheese. And I can't remember the name of the uh, partnership, but it was, Something in Louisell. Louisell. Joe Louisell was, at the time, known as the Perry Mason of Michigan. Or supposedly a highly regarded uh, criminal defense attorney, um, and he was retained by Miss Collins. Miss Collins evidently put a second mortgage on her house. It's got twenty thousand. It's going to be Neil Fink and Joseph um, Louisell. Is that how you pronounce Louisell. it? Louisell. Yeah. Louisell. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And so Lewisell and Fink uh, run, I believe, the preliminary examination. So in Michigan, the way it goes as far as you, you, you're arrested, you have what's called a probable cause conference, um, which is basically a pretrial. If it can't be resolved, then there's a thing called a preliminary examination in Michigan. The preliminary examination takes the place of a grand jury in most other states. Michigan has a grand jury system, or at least it's in the court rules. I've never run it. I run pre preliminary examinations all the time. And it is like a mini trial and it's the state's burden and it's a low burden uh, to prove to a probable cause standard, which is more likely than not that a crime was committed and the person charged with the crime committed it. So, and my joke is in Allegan County is that a ham sandwich can get bound over to circuit court, uh, that it takes very little uh, evidence all somebody has to do is get up there and say he did it. If you have 10 people saying that you didn't, that's an issue of material fact that's supposed to go to the jury. At least that's the way the judges in our county determine the probable cause standards. Very rare. I've only had a couple of cases where um, 
they're not bound over to circuit court for trial. So the, the, it starts out in district court in Michigan, which is just to determine whether or not there's probable cause. If they are bound over, which the judge finds that there was probable cause, and it goes to the trial court, which is the upper court, which is circuit court in Michigan. So just that's the background of the system, the way that it works in Michigan, and it did back then as it does now. So do they have grand juries in Miss, Mississippi? Yeah, we do the grand jur- jury. And in Virginia, as you know, we have grand jury. You see, grand juries are a little tougher on the defendant because the defendant gets no ability to cross-examine witnesses. It's just a jury. The prosecution puts on his case kind of a dog and pony. <clears throat> I think it's a kangaroo court, but, you know, who am I? I'm just a defense guy. You're just an attorney. Yeah, just an attorney. Just an attorney. So what, what I get to do at a preliminary examination and any other person does is, one, you get to lock in testimony. So this is what I wanted to bring forth as far as what Joe and I, the differences in what we know and what we do is, When you are charged with a crime in the United States, you have the power of the state against you. The only thing you have is whatever defense attorney you choose or is chosen for you, the Constitution, as much as a judge will allow, and a jury, okay? And that is the last bastion, in my mind, of democracy and freedom in the United States, okay? They're trying to denigrate that, and a lot of times... A lot of issues don't get to the jury because of a judge, okay? And in, in, in our county, or most counties that I practice in, most of the judges are former prosecutors, all right? So, Joe, what's your experience been as far as the criminal justice system yeah. from the cop side of life? Yeah, I mean, I think that we always feel like we, when things go wrong, and they do go wrong for us, you know, we're always thinking that they're against us. I think we have that. I think the problem that we see now is, and I don't think I'm speaking for the police. I think I'm just speaking for me right now is once the ball gets rolling on you, the things, and I think anybody would agree with this is that, you know, the whole year, and this is my personal opinion. I'm not really speaking as a police officer. And I want to emphasize that. Um, hmm. The fact that you're guilty, I mean, you're innocent until proven guilty. is not true. Yeah, that is. You're true. guilty until proven innocent. Hmm. Okay. And we're battling a lot of things now because there has probably been we're we're trying to fix the pendulum um, where, you know, I I believe there should be bail, but sometimes bail can be. Nobody can get out of it. Okay, Mm -hmm. and we have put innocent people in jail. We everybody knows that. So I, I think that once you get the power of the state against you, if you do not have the appropriate legal defense, it's going to be very bad for you. Yeah, it typically does end bad. And you have a lot of people pleading guilty to things they didn't do yeah. because of that, because they're facing, in our county, regularly the prosecution over charges. Okay, I yeah. just had a case where um, we were at the preliminary stage. We were set for the preliminary. We waited for an hour and a half for the prosecutor to show up. When he finally did, he handed me a paper upcharging my client to two life offenses. Okay, so a court-appointed lawyer may have just said, oh, well, you know, let's uh, I'll wave bind over and, uh, that way they won't charge my guy with two life offenses, but I've been down that road and the prosecutor still charges what they want to charge yeah. in the trial court. Okay. And I've, because prosecutors sit on the bench, they let this stuff fly. Okay. So, uh, here the cautionary tale, what do we do? I mean, the public service announcement. Yeah. yeah. PSA, everybody. Yep. One, shut up when the police show up at your door, at your window of your car. Um, be polite, you know. Be decline. polite, be professional, be quiet. Be, be professional, be quiet. Decline to, to um, answer any questions, okay? And as we see the videos that are prolific or ubiquitous in cell phones are proving out what's really going on out in the world, and I'm not a lot of what you see is the bad cops, all right? But the bad cops are in there. There's a belt. Yeah, you know, curve. and you want to see them. I mean, I mean, I mean, you got to see. Them. Yeah, I've I've never had a problem with that. And my my issue has always been is that the system allows cops to not tell the truth. Okay, well, I'd say they lie. All right, but you know, you when I say that a cop lies, they go, "Oh no, he just misstated the truth. He mistakenly misstated the truth." Well, when my client does is it's perjury. All right. Right. When a cop does it, it's a misstatement of the truth. All right. And 
Here's the problem with that. When the cops lie, then our whole system collapses like a house of cards because we have to rely on the integrity of the police because they're gathering evidence. They're doing investigations. Yeah. I mean, there's no difference. Look, you know, and it's, it's weird that we're still having this talk in 2022 because I joined the police department in 1984. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about there's no use for lying police. Yeah. I mean, it's 1984. I'm in the police academy. We have many, many talks about don't be a lying police officer. Yeah. And yet here we are in 2022 and people are still talking about it. Exactly. I believe that's a, a problem that starts, A, with the department, that they tolerate it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And two, I think it goes and it, gro- it, goes and it grows in the prosecuting office. office. Yeah. Because once the prosecutors see that, and I will tell you that I've worked with prosecutors that put an end to that, police officers doing that. Some do. It's rare. Um, though. It has to be. It has to be. There's hen's teeth in my, in my experience. But yeah, and it's, 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 it's got to be done. Because it's never okay. Let me clarify that. Lying policemen are never okay. Right. So back to John R. McCollins' case. Okay, you have these officers going around on their own showing eyeball witnesses uh, lineups with John Norman Collins's picture in it, okay? Which is unbelievable, but true. And um, that, to me, would be police misconduct in my in, in these days. Okay, back then, uh, Earl James in his book said, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no, no chance of a miscarriage of justice because the women refused to identify him based on a picture lineup, right? And I'm like, well, He's you're going to... Right. Yeah, yeah. And so um, that that was what we were saying is we, you know, we're not tipping our hand, but we have little doubt that John R. McCollins killed at least the people who he's, he was charged with. I mean, at least Karen Sue Bynum and probably most all of the others and then some, but and that, that, yeah, and others and others. And that's why we are, you know, on our 21st episode, because there are nine bodies that we counted that we went through. And know, when we so. finish this in that last episode, you're going to realize that most people think there was a lot more. Yeah. They really consider that there's a lot more. So the preliminary examination goes down and John McCollins is bound over to trial. Okay. I think between the prelim and the first hearing in the circuit court, um, Joe Lewis cell has a major heart attack. Yes. And I do think this is a, a game changer by the way. I do, too. So Neil Fink, who's three years out of law school, he becomes basically the lead counsel. Joe Lewisell, other than, and we haven't gotten there, but the voir dire, which is where the jury selected, he doesn't do much in the trial that I saw other than the voir dire. And, and at, when the trial starts, and I'll get to that, he looked gray and pasty, and he, I don't think he survived very much long after the, the trial, but we'll have more on that. But so, um, Joe, the... Also, a tragedy occurred for Mr. Booker. Okay, so as far as the defense team is, it's um, Neil Fink and Joe Lewisell, mm-hmm. and Lewisell is limping along after mm-hmm. after his heart attack. And and then um, on the other side of it, Booker Booker Williams is the assistant, pro- the main assistant prosecutor, chief assistant prosecutor, and William Delahaye mm-hmm. Dele is the head prosecutor. Okay. Um, Mr. Williams, his wife, unfortunately, suffered a brain, a brain, um, cerebral brain bleed or, or hemorrhage. And she subsequently dies during the beginning of this trial. OK, so in the beginning, Mr. Williams, who appeared to be Mr. Delay's uh, right arm man, was out. And unfortunately, uh, Mr. Williams was left with seven children. And uh, but he comes back, I believe, during the trial. He does come back. Yeah. So that's the players. And then um, I forget who the actual judge was, but there's a long tortured. uh, They say how good he was. He was 40 years on the bench Mm -hmm. that that, that he was all kosher deal. Everything went down exactly properly. I'm not sure that's true. There was repeated motions by the defense to um, change the venue out of Washtenaw County. Yes. And it went up to the appellate court and it was repeatedly denied. I think the first lawyer tried to do that. Richard Ryan tried or uh, 
the Ryan tried the court appointed second court appointed guy tried to do it, and then Fink and Lewis L tried repeatedly to change the venue. Okay, and the, the judge, I think he the logic was correct. This is, was a at least throughout Michigan a, a, a renowned. I mean, it was always in the paper. So, right. so where are you going to find if you can't find a jury in? Um, Washtenaw County, which is a liberal, what you, you know, it's a college town, two different colleges back in the day. So it would be liberal or progressive. I think they were calling it back then. Uh, then, then you wouldn't be able to find one. So the, the trial, the way um, the trial starts is the first thing they have to do is what's called voir dire. I call it voir dire. I'm not sure the exact pronouncement, but it's where you try to see the jury. They had brought in, I think it was 340 people as a jury pool. Uh, they struggled. I think it took, um, I don't know whether it took three weeks. It took them a long time to see the jury, but they finally, they didn't think they were, they were down to their last few people when they finally did seat the jury in Michigan. A jury for a felony is 12 people. They usually seat 14. There's two alternates because uh, in case somebody gets sick or they have to leave the trial, they all sit and watch. And then at the end, they do a random, uh, like a lottery, and pick the remaining 12 when they get ready, when the jury is finally charged to uh, make their decision. So, um, And I believe the judge is Judge John Conlon. Yeah, exactly right. I, it was, I know it was close to Collins, and I didn't want to confuse it, but it was John Collins, and he was a 40-year uh, attorney. He, uh, I think he worked on both sides of the fence. Um, he had been a, a, a judge for 13 years at the time. He was a two-pack-a-day camel smoker. and that Probably so he, filterless camels, so he was hardcore. Yeah, and my dad smoked those. They were rugged. Um, so... They uh, seat the jury. There was eight women, six men. I don't know if that bodes well for John Norman Collins or didn't, you know, women. Apparently it did not. And sex murder case, uh, probably not the best. Uh, They said Lewis L. did a good job. Um, The... There's several uh, professors' wives on the jury, which I don't know. One of them is going to become uh, pivotal uh, when the jury uh, does its deliberations and the counts come back. One of them is a law professor's um, wife, which becomes pivotal when we get to that side of life. But uh, so after the voir dire and the jury is seated, then they they impanel the jury and then. There's a series of uh, jury instructions that the judge has to give, and I always propose them. Um, And different judges do it differently, but um, when you do a voir dire, some judges, like in federal court, I've done federal trials, and they don't allow the the lawyer to ask any questions. Uh, In most state courts, they allow you to do, if not ask out all the questions, which in district court they do here in my county, in circuit court, you've got to submit your questions to the judge. Then you get to ask them because you don't know where it's going to lead. Because I always start out when I do my opening statement, I go, or when I'm doing voir dire, and I go, How many people here think my client's guilty? <laughs> you know? Some people always raise their hand. And I go, Hmm, are you, do you understand that there's a presumption of innocence, that there's been no evidence given in this trial yet, and that the only verdict you could give currently is not guilty? You know, and that's usually the way my voir dire start, you know, and most of the, of the better trial attorneys start it that way because you've got to make sure that the jury understands that just because, like my client that now is charged with five major felonies, just because you're charged with something is supposed to be meaningless to a jury. All right. That's a hard thing to overcome for anybody because you go, hmm, they're sitting over there and I put my guys in suits, even though if, if they're in orange or stripes. Uh, but if they're sitting there in orange with handcuffs on, they go, hmm, I wonder what that guy did, right? Yeah, so, looks guilty to me. <laughs> and most people believe that, right? So in my opening statements, I always come up with once upon a time, 
and I tell a story that the jury, that the, that the evidence is going to prove something. Okay. The prosecution is going to say, my case is going to prove X, Y, or Z. And I say, make them prove it. You know, I'm going to hold them to the standard of beyond all reasonable doubt, which is what the standard is in America. We're supposed to be. Okay. It gets denigrated denigrated because you go, Hmm, there's a dead woman who was butchered and dumped in a, in a, in a ravine. And here you're going to find when the trial starts, they've got some iffy scientific evidence that they use against John McCollum. So what we were saying in the beginning is whether John R. McCollins is guilty is not much doubt as to that. But when they did this trial, his due process was trampled on, at least, right? They right. put him in the hole, you know, trying to influence him to get a <laughs> confession. And then this, the lineup was really shaky, and there's some other shaky stuff, too, that, that's going to be exposed during the trial. But um, So I think I've run through the polygraph. The police, I wouldn't call it misconduct, but definitely not kosher deal action. How much you would hope for even in 1970? Yeah, even in 1970. And then uh, the issues regarding the, the, uh, the attorneys and um, though – uh, they had picked a really good defense attorney and Neil Fink, I think, went on to become a really good defense attorney. And that's what Louis Silva, I think, had hired Neil Fink. But Neil Fink picked up the heavy lifting during the trial, which we'll see. And actually, he's the one who does the opening statement. It's not Louis Sell who usually would do, which I mean, I'm, I've been an attorney for 25 years. So I have done a lot of four deers and a lot of opening statements. And it's all you want to at least make sure that the jury has an open mind, right? And they had one, this is, this is interesting. So when they were doing the voir dire, one of the questions, uh, Louis L asked, I said, well, um, do you believe, uh, have you, have you made, have you made, uh, do you have an opinion as to his guilt? She says, yeah, I think he's guilty. She's like, and so he goes, um, why is that? Said, well, all the murder stopped once <laughs> arrested right and this is the thing about tainting a jury pool so you got 340 people sitting there listening to that right right and so you got to really finesse what questions you're asking don't ask questions don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer that is exactly what the mantra is and that's what you gotta live by that's live by that it isn't just about court that's what your whole (laughs) that is true you don't want to know that. That is true. But here's what they do in Allegan and in many other counties. The prosecutors that are sitting on the bench, they go, well, that being said, I had this happen in a federal court. I had a, uh, I did a jury trial, a three-week jury trial in Detroit for a crim- uh, uh, prisoner's rights case. That was basically about a typewriter, if you could imagine that. And the state spent about a couple hundred thousand dollars on a case that I said I'd settle for $500 and give him my type, client's typewriter back. But anyway, they had this woman sitting on the jury. She was an elderly white person. And my, my, my gal, my guy was a black convicted murderer. Right. And so the judge said, well, Miss Smith, uh, do you have any prejudices against uh, Mr. Baker? You know, the, whatever, Ms. my, my client. And she said, no, well, no, not really any prejudices, but I believe if he's in prison, he's in prison for a reason. And he had, prisoners have no rights. And I'm like, this was a prisoner's rights case on the <laughs> constitutional prisoner rights case. So, and I'm like, your honor, I'd like to strike this. I'd like to thank and strike, you know, Ms. Smith for her service, right? And the judge says, well, Ms. Smith, can you set aside your biases and, and, and render a fair and equitable judgment? He said, she said, yes. And I said, well, wait a minute now, judge. You know, she just said she believes he's guilty and that prisoners have no rights. So I wanted to strike her for um, yes. cause. So that means that I, in jury selection, each side gets so many preemptive challenges. That means you can throw anybody off for any reason other than for uh, discriminatory purposes. All mm-hmm. right. But you get an unlimited amount for cause. So if they're biased, you get them booted. And this, this was a black judge, a really good judge. His name was Drain. Is Drain. Uh, he wouldn't allow me to kick him for ca- her for cause and made me use a preemptive challenge. So anyway, that's just I'm just saying that there are 
points in time in a criminal trial that the judge can put their thumb on the scale of justice and tip it one way or the other. And usually it's the way for the state that they're tipping it, at least the prosecutors in my experience. So anyway, I'm off my soapbox, but so we are, we've gone through John Norman Collins' arrest, his jail, the preliminary examination, the beginning of the trial of Ward Deer and the opening statements. And I think that's as far as we were going to go today. I don't know how we are timelines. We're good. We're good. And I think we'll just add that we're going to talk about some hair evidence next time. And that's what we're really going to focus on because we have talked about the fact that he did drive around in his motorcycle and let everybody, you know, including God, see him out there. So that is true. hair evidence is what we're going to focus on next week. Yes. What, what other things that haven't don't have to do with this, but just when I was reading, preparing for today, what I didn't realize was, so this murder occurred in the like house. Mm-hmm. He was known to have take, taken women to that house whenever he could. I mean, there was at least three to five that had come forward before this trial and had talked to uh, Earl James saying that one, he raped in March the 9th, which I didn't tell you, Joe, but that is uh, about 11 days before Jane Mixer disappears. And so he took her on March the 9th to the like house and, and raped her. So yeah, the, the like house. And I think we've discussed it in many, many episodes. Uh, that's just amazing that nobody did anything about that. Well, and I don't, you may have mentioned it before too, but, Jarman Collins had a motorcycle um, theft ring. Yeah, we've talked. He, about he was storing a Bull Taco motorcycle in that garage at, yeah. at some point, and also he was riding with a sergeant from the EMU uh, police department regularly. Yeah, with stolen stuff. We don't want to belabor that. We've mentioned it in several episodes, but for those that are new to here, um, unbelievable that yeah. nobody put anything together. He should have been arrested. Let me say it again for the fourteenth time. <laughs> a lot of people would have been left a lot All right so next week we're going to focus on the fact that he is found guilty i mean that's not a mystery that's not a spoiler okay right. but we're going to go into that hair evidence we will do that for better or worse so well, that's yeah. where we're going to stop right now today and uh, again we thank everybody we got a couple more episodes and we appreciate everybody hanging tough with us right Hit like and subscribe. I think we've picked up a couple more subscribers here. We recently. have, and um, we're getting views, and we're over many, many platforms, and we stick everything together. I'm very happy. Um, just hang in there, gang. Getting ready mm-hmm. to wrap it up. So we do appreciate everybody. We look forward to it. Hit like, subscribe. Little link down there if you'd like to send us some money. We do have to spend a little bit, so we'd love to recruit a little bit. Working on getting some merch. So we got that. So stand by for some other announcements too, because um, they're coming. So we appreciate it. We thank everybody. And until next time. See you.